Amen, amen. It's so good to see you here today. Is it good to see me? Okay, all right. Just, there's just this awkward silence, and I, I felt like the uninvited guest for a moment. It felt weird. So, uh, well, it's good to see you. We are continuing in our sermon series from the book of Acts. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 4. We'll begin at verse 23 and we'll go through 31. Now, if you did not bring a Bible, we've got you covered. You can reach underneath the seat in front of you and use one of those Bibles that are there. In fact, if you don't have a Bible that you can read and understand easily, we invite you to take that Bible home with you. Uh, so we're going to be in that Bible out there on page 1084. We really believe that if we read the word of God and apply the word of God, he will change our lives. And let me tell you something about Calvary. We love life change here at Calvary. We love watching God change and transform marriages, change and transform individuals. Uh, it's just an amazing thing to see. Uh, if you're joining us online, thank you for being there with us. We're glad that you are here. Feel free to chat and leave comments and talk to people. We know that it can get a little uh, hard when you're just sitting there watching us at times. So interact with other believers out there online. We're just so glad you are there. So in today's passage of scripture, we get to look at one of the first moments that followers of Jesus experience persecution. We get to look at one of the first moments that they experience opposition since Jesus told them to go bring the life-changing gospel to the ends of the earth. We get to see if they really believe what they say they believe. We get to see if, they're, if they really are convinced that God is in control or are they just talk. In the South, we call that putting your money where your mouth is. Uh, if, if somebody made a bet, we would say, put your money where your mouth is if you really believe this. So we get to see if they really believe what they say they do. Today we're going to find out. So let's, uh, let me provide a little bit of a background. In case you haven't noticed, Acts is this incredible story that's weaved together throughout uh, the Bible. This, uh, this letter of Acts is moving and our sermons are really building off of the stories Typically, when we walk through a gospel or a, a letter or a passage of scripture, we're kind of tying everything in together with the thoughts. This is actions. We get to tie everything in together with actions. And so several of the last uh, sermons all tie in to the sermon today. Now, as we're looking at this, Peter and John were followers of Jesus. They were inside the temple area. They were teaching about Jesus. They taught that the forgiveness of sins only came through what Jesus did on the cross. There were also another group of teachers there. They were Jewish leaders. They were Jew members of the Jewish council and they did not like Jesus much at all. Uh, they were not fans of Jesus at all. They weren't fans of followers of Jesus at all. In fact, they taught exactly the opposite. They taught that in order to get to heaven, you had to obey all the commands in the Old Testament. And then if you were lucky, you got into heaven. So for the record, just so you know, the same message that Peter and John preached is the same message that Calvary teaches today. We teach the life-changing message of the gospel that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, that Jesus died, that Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and that if you and I want to experience that life change, you and I need to make a decision to receive Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. Now, I did that in 1991. If you would like to commit your life to following Jesus, we'll have members of the prayer team here at the close of our service. If you want to experience the life-changing, transforming power of the gospel, we'll have members of our prayer team here at the front. They would love to talk with you about that. Now, uh, after Peter preaches in this message of hope, uh, after Peter preaches this message, the Jewish leaders were ticked off. They were angry. They huddled together. Uh, they pulled one another aside and said, we've got to do something about this. And they looked and everybody was celebrating because of this message of hope. They saw that this man, there was a man that had been crippled, that was healed. They weren't really sure what to do about it, but they knew that if they punished Peter and John too much, then the people would revolt and not listen to anything that they have to say. So they pulled Peter and John together 
to, uh, together and they threatened to punish them if they continued to talk about Jesus. Essentially, they threatened them and said, look, we're going to let you go this time. We're going to let you off the hook. But if you teach any more in the name of Jesus, we will punish you. It's basically like your mom and dad telling you to do something and then saying, or else, right? Or else. Have you ever lived underneath a threat? This was Peter and John. They were members of the Jewish community. And now the Jewish leaders said to them, talk no more in the name of Jesus or else something bad is going to happen to you. These were the same people that killed Jesus. These were the same people that crucified Jesus. And I'm sure that for Peter and John, they felt the weight of that threat. Have you ever lived underneath a threat? When I was a sophomore in high school, I lived under a threat for about a year of this muscle-bound guy named Mario. Uh, Mario, he, his brother's name was Luigi. Mario was... <laughs> Mario was dating my next door neighbor. Now understand, we live way out in the sticks. If you had a next door neighbor, that was a big deal. So my next door neighbor and Mario were dating. She and I were the same age. Her younger brother and I were great friends. So I was always over at their house. We'd be playing basketball. We'd be playing Atari video games. We'd hang out all the time. We all three were just great friends. Mario did not like that I spent so much time over at their house, so he threatened me. One day he grabbed me, he pulled me into the teacher's lounge and told me to never ever go over to her house again. Now, I've shared this before. In high school, I weighed and looked a lot like Steve Urkel, except a different color, okay? I mean, I weighed maybe 120 pounds. It's depending on how much my skeleton weighed. I had no muscle mass at all. Mario, on the other hand, was a football player. Mario was probably benching 300 pounds in the football locker room. Uh, so in other words, Joe equaled puny and weak. Mario equaled big and strong. Follow me? So Mario grabs me. He tells me, don't ever go over to her house again. Now, I was away from my family. I had grown up with brothers and sisters, but now I was living with my grandmother, and I had no other family but my neighbors. And so now I'm choking up. I'm fighting back tears because I'm angry. And I looked at him, and I said to him, I'm going to go over there. They are my family. They are my brothers and sisters. They, they, they are close and you cannot stop me. So for the next year, I spent my life dodging Mario in the halls of the high school. When I would see Mario walking down one end of the hallway, I would duck into the bathroom or I'd duck into a classroom or I'd strike up a conversation with the assistant principal who was walking down the hall. And Mario would always cross over to where I was, take his big, like massive shoulder and just slam it right into me as I walked by. So for an entire year or school year, I lived under that threat. I never knew exactly what was going to happen to me. Thankfully, my next door neighbor broke up with him and that ended that season of threat, if you will. So raise your hand. It's time for raise your hand time with Pastor Joe, okay? Raise your hand if you ever felt threatened by somebody when you were in school. Okay, raise your hand if you were threatened and you tried to avoid the person like I did. All right, raise your hand if you were threatened but you stood up to him and punched him in the eye or something. Okay, a few heroes, thank you. Raise your hand if you were the person that did the threatening. Ah. Aren't you grateful for life change? Aren't you grateful for life change, right? I mean, that's how the life-changing power of the gospel changes lives. So we have those who were in the room that were bullies and we have those who were bullied and we all follow and worship now the same God. He brings life change and I'm so glad that he does. Let's take a look at how Peter and John responded to the threats against them. Now, what we're going to do with this passage of scripture is we're going to Oreo cookie it. You know how I eat Oreo cookies? I'll take the top off and I'll eat the top. 
Then you take the filling off and you eat the bottom. And then finally you eat the filling, okay? We're gonna look at the top of the passage of scripture from Acts 4, uh, 23. And then we're gonna look at the bottom and then we're gonna go back and look at the filling. You follow me? You good? Okay. Acts 23, 24, and then we'll jump to verse 31. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. Now skip to verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, this was a moment for Peter and John when they really were not sure what they were supposed to do. The Jewish leaders were the very same people that had threatened Jesus, that had chased Jesus for three years and had falsely accused Jesus of crimes. These were the same Jewish leaders that bribed Judas and persuaded the Roman authorities to brutally and publicly beat, whip, and crucify Jesus. And now these leaders had just threatened them. They did not know that the Jewish leaders, uh, what the Jewish leaders were going to do to them, so they lived underneath this threat. They went back to the other followers of Jesus. They told them what had happened. And look what happened as soon as they said uh, what they had heard. As soon as they had heard. This group of believers prayed together. Verse 24 t uh, tells us that they lifted their voices together to the Lord. What is that? That's a prayer. But they were praying together. And when we skip their prayer in the middle, we see the end result in verse 31 is that they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. See, there are times when we feel intimidated, frustrated, when we feel weak, when we feel threatened, we can learn from this example that bold prayers lead to bold lives. See, the disciples were intimidated. Jesus told them to go out to others and tell them about him, and they did. Now they were being threatened. Now they were being harassed. But instead of turning inward, instead of ducking into a bathroom and hiding, they prayed boldly, and that prayer was answered immediately. The ground was shaken. They were filled with the bold power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now I have a, a confession. Too often, way too often, my prayers are not bold. Too often, my inner prayers the things that are really weighing me down, the things that I'm really concerned about, too often they stay inside me. Too often I take my needs and don't express them or share them with other people. I keep the prayers to myself and instead of inviting others to join me in praying over matters that are personal in my life, I hold them at a distance. The very first thing that Peter and John did was to go find other followers of Jesus, tell them what happened, and they all joined together in prayer. So if you want to begin the journey toward, toward bolder prayers and a bolder faith, stop asking for prayer and join others, uh, other believers in praying. When was the last time that you asked somebody to pray for you over something specific and then, right then, you both stopped and you prayed together? See, the first time I did that was in 1999. I was serving at a church in Nashville, Tennessee, and we were all filing into the worship center, and a grandmother of one of my students uh, came over to me. I was standing in the doorway. She just stopped me, and she said, will you pray for me? Her name was Sue. I said, what's going on? She said, I have cancer on my tongue, and I'm terrified that they're going to remove my tongue. Will you pray for me? And so I, I cradled her head with my hands and I prayed for her and we prayed together that God would destroy the cancer and would keep her tongue. 
He did. At my last church that I served at in Arkansas, our children's pastor was told that his pregnant wife was going to lose their baby because there wasn't enough amniotic fluid in the, in the sack. Uh, now, we prayed boldly for God to increase the fluid. We, we called the church together. We brought everyone in and we're leading the church to read through Psalm 139 and we're praying and we're inviting God to work a miracle. And now their Facebook page is flooded with pages of little Lily bossing her older brothers around. When we join together and pray boldly for something, God often shows up and changes lives. It's a, it's a principle, a biblical principle of Matthew 18 when Jesus said, where two or three are gathered there in my name, I am there in the midst of them. But sadly, I know that as a pastor, yet I don't invite others into my prayer life very often. I often pray for other people, but I keep my requests and my needs to myself. I pray boldly for others, but I won't let others pray boldly for me. See, I don't tell friends that I'm worried that we'll never be able to find a home here in Havasu and invite them to pray boldly to God and ask him to provide for us. I don't tell friends that I'm worried that my wife is working too much right now, basically doing three jobs with the district, and I don't ask them to pray boldly that she would experience refreshing energy and rest. I don't tell friends that I'm worried about not spending personal time with the Lord as much as I used to. And I don't tell friends that I'm worried about burning out or relying upon myself to do the work that God has called me to do instead of trusting in him. So what needs do you have that you hide from others? Is it a diagnosis that you've received and not inviting others to pray boldly for you? Is it in your marriage? Is it your job? Gosh, are you having an affair and you're afraid to let other people know so that they can pray boldly that God would break that relationship off? Are you addicted to alcohol, drugs, or pornography? And are you scared to invite others into your life to pray with you? Again, our prayer team will be here at the close of our service after that last song. They would love to pray with you over any need that you have they would be honored to bring your request to God to lift them up because they love you and we believe that God will answer prayers. Are you willing to let your guard down? And we all have them. Are you willing to let that wall down enough for other followers of Jesus to pray boldly for you? If you are, it will change your life. Remember that a bold prayer life is not a solo prayer life. Don't just ask for prayer. Invite others to join with you while praying and in praying. And when you do that, when you invite others in, use scripture. Use scripture for a bold prayer life. Now we're gonna look at that middle of the Oreo cookie, okay? We're gonna look at this prayer that these disciples prayed. In Acts 4, beginning in verse 24, they, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together in God and said, here's their prayer. Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan have predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. See, as they gathered together with these other believers to pray, they used scripture to shape their prayer. Now, 
I have a few verses that I've memorized and I fall back on for certain prayers. So when I'm feeling discouraged or when I feel like I'm not gonna amount to anything or when, the, you know, when my childhood memories overwhelm me and I just don't feel that God's really gonna do anything with me in my life, I fall back on Philippians 1.6 that says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. And I'm reminded as I pray, God, you're not done with me yet. You're still working on me. You're still changing me. You're still transforming me. And you are my hope. In you, I have hope because you're not done with me yet. You know how I can tell that? Because I got a pulse. Take your fingers, put them on your wrist. If you have a pulse, God is not done working in you either. Another verse that I fall back on uh, when somebody asks me questions or maybe I'm counseling them and they say, I just don't know what God wants for my life. I just don't know what, what God wants to do with me. I fall back on Isaiah 30, 21. Whether you turn to the right or the left, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Using scripture to shape my prayer life. And so I, I, I quote that verse as I'm praying for them and I just simply say, Lord, I pray that you would guide them. Whether they turn to the right or the left, they would hear you and they would hear you guiding them. If someone's in an abusive situation and they ask for prayer, I fall back on the promise of God in Isaiah 42, 3, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And I remind them that God is a gentle God. He's a loving God. He's a God of restoration. He's a God who redeems. He's a God that can take the broken and not break them any further, but that he can build them up and restore them and strengthen them. See, I'm convinced that the more that we, as a body, incorporate scripture into our prayer life, the bolder then we will begin to live out our faith. The more confidence that we'll have as followers of Jesus to live in a world that is seemingly growing further and further and further away from truth. The bolder our prayers become, the bolder our lives will become. But remember this, bold lives Bold lives are not bossy lives. Almost every day in my house, I hear one of my kids say to the other one, you're not the boss of me. Raise your hand if you have children that say that in your house or grandchildren that you've heard say that. I don't, well, you guys are doing a great job with parenting. I am amazed. We're doing a terrible job because almost every day I hear one of my kids say to the other, you're not the boss of me. You know what? Kids don't like to get bossed around and neither do adults, do we? We don't like to get bossed around. We don't like it when other people tell us how to live our lives. But there's always a temptation for a follower of Jesus as they begin to grow bold in their faith and they begin to live boldly for Jesus that they become bossy. They start telling other people how they ought to be living. They start telling other people how they should be living and that they're living wrong and that they need to be doing what's right. We have to remember that bold lives are not bossy lives, but bold lives gently explain hope in Jesus. See, we're called to boldly live out our faith in our community. And we're, we're called to live in our community just as Jesus lived in his community. 1 John 2, 6 tells us that whoever claims to live in Christ must walk as Jesus did. And just as Jesus moved and worked in his community, we are called to walk in our community the very same way. That means we care about those who are broken, those who are hurting, that we don't go to them with a haughty spirit or a judgmental attitude or a holier than thou uh, mindset. We go to them in our own brokenness as followers of Jesus. We love them. We encourage them. We speak words of hope to them because we all acknowledge you and I want to be spoken to that way as well. We want to be encouraged. We want to be built up. We want to be loved. And God has called us to love others as he has loved us. 
And as we're loving them, as we're serving our community in our schools projects or food drive projects, another way to show that uh, love is by participating in the coat drive that we have right now. As we do that, we gently explain the reason why we can serve and do good because Jesus changed our lives. He forgave our sins. He gave us hope. And because he gave us hope, he gave us the ability to love our community because their sin doesn't impact us. So we can love them and we can help them. And when we boldly live out our faith and we love others, God transform hearts. God transforms lives. He did it 2,000 years ago. We're seeing him do it today. And he wants to use you to gently explain to others the hope that you have. So live boldly, not bossy. Call together with other Christians. Call out to God in prayer. And live out a faith that brings life change. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And we want to say thank you for loving us. Thank you for changing our lives. Thank you for giving us hope. And Father, it's my prayer that all of us would begin to develop a bolder faith. Not that's harsh and cruel and, and judging to others, but a bold faith that invites others to know where our journey is, to know what we're experiencing, and to call out to you together in prayer.